preacher many, many years ago, and he used to tell a story all the time. He used to tell a story that a young man went for an interview, for a job. As soon as he went for an interview, um, he was looking for who is doing the interview. So the, everybody's working seriously and nobody's uh, uh, paying attention to this young man. And this young man is just walking around the company. And then he came by, they, they came by one man who is really, um, really worried. So in like depression and he is feeling angry. When he saw this man angry, he said, I'm, I've come for a job interview, will you give me a job? He says, there is no position in this company except for one position, he said. And that position is a vice president position. He said, what is the salary for the vice president, he said. Um, in those days, many, many years ago, so he said, the salary is $10,000. Okay? Um, that's a great salary for, um, to apply for, said the applicant. But he said, um, you know, you should ask what the job demands. He said, okay, tell me what are the responsibilities of a vice president? And he said, I'm the president of the company. I am putting all my worries on you. He says, you should take care, and that is your job. Take all my worries on you, and that's your job, he said. And then he said, where does my $10,000 come from? Asked the new applicant. He said, that's your first worry, he said. Where does my pay come from? Asked the guy who's applying for a job. I said, that's your first worry, that you have to generate enough income, that you should have a salary. And not only that you should have a salary, but you should have a salary for everyone in the company. Worry, worry, worry. We look at problems and we look at situations. And then how to solve our worries and anxieties and, and then issues that we have? What is the solution for all the things that we go through? The just shall live by faith. Shall we say amen? The just shall live by faith is not a, just a statement that you pull out from the Bible, that you read it out of the context. A text without a context can become a pretext for any text. That's why you should always read text in its context. The just shall live by faith is the word God spoke to a prophet. God spoke to a prophet in, in the midst of huge trouble. And the trouble is this. Habakkuk is seeing the nation, and he sees the nation of people of Israel, that there is sin everywhere. There's sin everywhere. If you have your Bible open, please look at Habakkuk chapter 1. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 and 4. And this message is um, what the Lord has put on my heart to, um, to share today. Specifically, God wants to speak to us through this. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Oh, I cry for violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity or sin? Why do you ideally look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. The justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Habakkuk is crying to God and said, I see violence everywhere. I see people living in sin everywhere. What is this Lord? Lord, are you not seeing? You know, when, some, when, we, when you look at suffering, when you see a starving child dying, when you see some people dying with HIV, some people dying with, you know, these kind of things, you know what people ask the question? The first question people ask is, where is God? Is that not right? When you see somebody suffering terribly, the first question people ask is, where is God? And during the time of Adolf Hitler, in the Nazi concentration camps, he is killing Jewish people for no reason. He brings all the concentration camps and they, they hang a small child, probably six year old, seven year old child. And all of them watching, all of them, you know, older people in their 60s and 70s, they are crying that a small child has become a victim of a, of a brutal monster of uh, Adolf Hitler. And then one of the person with tears do not know what to do, he said, he cried out and said, where is God? He cried out. You see, that is the question that we always struggle with. Why is God silent? Why is not God doing anything? Habakkuk's struggle is the same thing. He is seeing sin multiply in the nation. You see the violence multiply in the nation. You see bloodshed shed, shed. And then here is Habakkuk in a worry. He's complaining with God. 
He is, he is, he is wrestling with God. He is struggling with God. He says, Lord, why is this? Why is this? How many of you watch news every day? News, CNN? If you watch for CNN for one hour, is it good news or bad news? Anybody tell me. Have you ever seen a good news saying, if anybody is sick, come to me and I will heal? Or we have found a hospital that can heal every disease. Have you ever seen a TV announcement like that? All jobless people, you can come to me and then I'll make sure that I'll provide you. Have you ever seen any commercial like that? If you have any worries, you know, you can carry, come to me and I will take all your worries away. Have you seen any commercial like that? Watch CNN, Fox or NBC or ABC or MSNBC, whichever TV channel you watch. All the news. Is it good news or bad news? Tell me, please. Nobody wants to open their mouths. Most of the news, 95% is bad news. It's not really good news. All the news that you watch is no real. And then if you watch something like that, you sit and see, oh, the elections are coming. The economy is going down. There's, there's so many layoffs, so many this, so many. Your worry sets in. Depression sets into a person. And then a person will go um, weaker and weaker. He'll lose faith. But in the midst of all these things, in a very similar situation, you see Habakkuk is crying out to God. Lord, what are you doing? Lord, what are you doing? Then God speaks. You know what he speaks? What he says? Hey prophet, you're waiting. You know, you see the problem is this. The, you know, the world has problems. But nobody is really asking God, why are there problems? Who will handle their problems? We need to learn to take our problems to him. And to tell him everything. When you tell him everything, God will listen. Shall we say Amen. Most of you is clueless for what's happening. We're clueless for what is happening because we never tell God. Habakkuk told God, and he said like this. Look among the nations. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5 and onwards, let me read. Wonder and be astounded, for I'm doing a work in your days that if I would tell you, nobody would believe it. For behold, I'm raising up Chaldeans, the bitter, hasty nation, who's, who march through the breadth of the earth to, see, to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity uh, go forth for themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fierce than evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horses come from far. They fly an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces forward. They gather captives like a sand. At kings they scoff. At rulers they laugh. They laugh. Laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it up. They will sweep it like a wind and go on. You know, Habakkuk was expecting a good thing. God is giving even more bad news. What is this, Lord? I've, you know, all this world is giving me bad news, and I thought that you can give me a good news. But God is saying, I'm going to give, and give, give you even more bad news, he said. So Habakkuk is heartbroken. He's sitting. So what is... What does God tell Habakkuk? God tells Habakkuk is this, I am raising up Babylon, Chaldeans. King Nebuchadnezzar would come and that fellow, and then he describes, God describes Nebuchadnezzar's army. You know how he is describing? He's saying their horses are swifter than leopards, he said. And then they are like an eagle that just comes and grabs and goes. You know, if they see any king or a kingdom, they just smile at it, they just laugh at it so that they can come and devour it. Such a great army. Then he says, he is even more terrified. He's even more terrified and then he says, Lord, why did you allow this? Why did you allow this? He says, your eyes do not see sin, right? Why did you allow this problem? Why are you doing this? He says, oh, you ordain judgment. You will not do what is wrong, he says. Why do you allow, you know, wicked people to deal with the righteous people? Listen to me, my dear brothers and sisters, carefully. The reason why I'm telling you this is this. God wants to say, hey, Israel is a righteous people, chosen people. But they are sinning in the light of the very word that they have. I've given them the commandments. I've given them the command covenants. I've given them the word of God. And they are going away from me in the light of the word. So what I will do is, you know, the so-called righteous nation will be destroyed by a wicked people. Wicked people. You know... God's solution is this. Why does God have to punish Israel? 
God is allowing this trouble on Israel for a reason that they are sinning against him. They are turning away from him. They are not keeping his word. They are not loving him. You know, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. That was a commandment given to Israel. And that's a commandment given to the church. But the basic question, do you really love the Lord is the question. Oh, I can say I love the Lord. But if the Lord says, what is the proof that you love me? If God asks you a proof, is there a proof in your own heart that you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your power to correct us, to chasten us? You know, God loves his children. God loves his children that he won't just sit quiet. If somebody's just living a, a, a life of sin, playing with sin, God would send trouble and correct him. And Habakkuk is waiting and waiting. He told the complaint to God. God even answered him. That's chapter one. And then God even tells him a terrible thing. And then he, he's complaining more to God. Lord, why are you allowing this? You know, the complaint there is, you're allowing a, a wicked nation to destroy a righteous nation. The Lord says, I have a plan for doing that. And then he waits. The second chapter is waiting. From worry to waiting. You know, what is God's, God's solution for worry? If everybody is around going away, you know, what we think about life, Christian life, is this. I should have an easy life, comfortable life. When in the words of Lord Jesus, he spoke these three things. Narrow is the gate, hard is the path, but it leads to eternal life. A gate, a path, and a destiny. Remember these three things. A gate, a path, and a destiny. He says, wide is the gate, broad is the way. You know, have you heard the term Broadway? Broadway is known for theater in this world. New York is famous for Broadway theaters. Even this city is famous for Broadway. What Broadway meaning to entertain? If you think that, you know, the whole world would somehow be saved at the end, you're dreaming. These are not the words of Lord Jesus. Narrow is the gate. Harder is the path. But the end leads to life. But... You know, big is the gate, broader path. We want to, you know, we, we want our life to be on a cruise, highway. But the Lord said, your life will not be on like driving on a highway. Get onto the highway, get out till exit, hit 80 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour. If there's no other thing, rather hit more than 100 mi miles an hour, cruise so that you'll be home soon. That is not what a Christian life is. The Lord is taking us through these things so that we may know who he is. Chapter 1 for his worry. What is, what is Jesus' answer for the worry? I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6, please. If you're seeing everything and I say, okay, Lord, so many troubles around. I see a marketplace. I see like, look at my health. You know, I look at my bank account. I look at my life. I look at my, you know, everything. I don't think anything is going right. You know, the trouble everywhere. What should I do? Matthew chapter 6, if you have your Bible, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. But what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, what you will put on, is not life more than body? Is not, is not life more than food? Is not body more than clothing? The, the word in King James is, do not be, you know, uh, do not be careful, do not care for how you live. Meaning, it's not telling us to live a careless life. Meaning, do not worry. Do not be anxious. Do not be, live in anxiety. You know, it seems one preacher used to pray like this. One great preacher who, was, uh, who worked in military, he prayed like this. Lord, help us to live by faith every day. So that we may not borrow from tomorrow's trouble. And get ulcers as a proof of lack of faith, he said. Meaning if you worry, he say, he's saying, you'll get a lot of ulcers. You know, worry is the greatest killer uh, and, and the source of every disease, major diseases uh, in the world. This man prayed like this, Lord, let me not borrow us from tomorrow's troubles and get ulcers as a proof of lack of faith, he prayed. What a prayer, what a prayer it is, telling God, Lord, let me not Dig into tomorrow's troubles. Tomorrow troubles, you know, let tomorrow take care. The Lord said like this, do not live with anxiety. 
then he, his answer is this. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor they reap. Yet the Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than them? You know, where the worry will go, if your eyes are not on the problem, if your eyes are on the Lord, on the Heavenly Father, knowing that you have a Father in Heaven, your, your worries will come to an end. Shall we say Amen? If you keep your eyes on your problem, all the time, you know, you'll be so discouraged, so depressed. But if your eyes are on the Heavenly Father, He says, you look at the birds, your Father feeds them. Are you not more precious than birds? Today, my dear brothers and sisters, if you are worried about any circumstance in your life, let me tell you, by the authority of the name of the Lord and the scripture, you are more precious to the Lord Jesus and to the Heavenly Father than all the creation. Shall we say amen? You know, God spoke and he created all the um, creatures. But he created you and me with his hand. Humanity is the pinnacle of God's creation. He cares about you. He cares about me. And even, you know, the scripture says, even when one hair falls to the ground, he takes a note of it. You know, you don't know how many hairs will fall out if you brush your hair, if you comb. God will take a note when one falls down. One falls down. For some people give God an easy job. Less hair. For others, God has to update his database every time when somebody brushes. But God is so mindful. You don't know how many hairs fall. You don't know how many tossings you have. But God is mindful. That's what it says, Matthew chapter 6. And then he says like this. And why are you anxious about your clothing? I know verse 27. Which of you, which of you by being anxious, can add a single hour of span of life. Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor they spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field which is destroyed today and alive tomorrow, is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What we shall eat, what we shall drink, what we shall wear. For Gentiles seek after, and your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all of them. Heavenly Father knows all your needs. Shall we say amen? amen. Heavenly Father knows your needs. Let me repeat that statement. Heavenly Father knows your needs. I'm repeating it third time, so that you get it and let it sink. These are the words of Lord Jesus. He knows your needs. He knows my needs. The needs, the Lord knows it very well. That's why let's not worry. And then he says, see, if you seek his kingdom and his righteousness, everything shall be added to you. Shall we say amen? Habakkuk in his trouble. He was not worried if Babylonians, the Lord is saying Babylonians are coming to destroy everyone. You know, we are living a comfortable life in this country especially. If you think about Christians, I meet uh, Assyrian Christians on, on Divan a lot. And these folks say like this, we, have, we, have, we ran away from Iraq. The reason is, we are being killed. We are being killed for being Christians, and that's why we emigrate to this country. You and I now don't, do not go through that kind of thing. For, for the Christ's sake, they are going through struggle. But they ran away from the country. You see, the reason why I'm telling you is this. All our worries, we need to take it to the Lord. All your situations, you need to take it to the Lord. Knowing that your Heavenly Father needs, he knows about you, knows that you need all these things. The Lord knows our needs. Corrie Turnboom was a lady. This lady um, was a Jewish lady, but she became a, a Christian. Um, she was a wonderful Christian. Um, she and her sister were being beaten by the German soldiers. And then the, her sister used to get um, uh, so upset that she used to um, curse these soldiers who used to beat, beat them up. Um, they have to work in a concentration camp. If they don't work, um, the uh, German soldier would come and beat them up. Um, but Cory used to say, hey, don't curse them. Don't use bad words for them. You know, our God is watching all these things and we are praying, right? Our Lord is watching and he will deliver us and he won't give us into the hand of death. Surely, you know, of all those uh, camps, very few were saved. Very few were saved. And Corey and his sister 
were the two who were saved because they were praying every day and waiting on the Lord. And then she writes a, her testimony called Hiding Place. When death is all around, that is the situation where Habakkuk is. Babylon will come and destroy everybody. Every house will be destroyed. Temple will be destroyed. Temple will be burned down. But the just shall live by faith. They make God their hiding place. Cory Ten Boom was saved and his family. I will tell you that, you know, Habakkuk, how God answered Habakkuk. Many, many examples, like Jeremiah. I'll give you one example. You know, Jeremiah prophesied that, you know, Israel will be taken into uh, captivity for 70 years. You know, when B Babylonians came, what, where was Jeremiah? Jeremiah was put in a dungeon. He was in a prison. You know, when, when they came to attack, you know, they burned every house. They burned every house. They burned even the temple. They destroyed the temple. They burned the temple in Jerusalem. But they, you know, after they do that, one of the commanders said, I heard about one prophet in, in Jerusalem called Jeremiah. Where is he? They came searching. And he was, in, uh, he was in dungeon. He was in prison. They let him come out. They bring out and says, sir, we are not going to do anything to you. We are not going to take you captive. Go back home. In the midst that every house is destroyed, just before it is destroyed, God tells Jeremiah, I want you to buy land. I want you to buy. Lord, whole country is, will be taken by the Babylonian. Now you want me to put money and take, buy something now? You know, a lot of people think about, hey, when should you buy land? When you not should buy land? People are very, um, very good thinkers. Oh, our state is dividing Andhra and Telangana. Should I buy land or not, not buy land? When the whole country nation is being taken over by Babylonians, the Lord is telling him, buy land. So he goes and put, gives money and he buys the land. He says, even if the whole country goes, I'll make sure that your family lives. Jeremiah was commanded not to marry. Jeremiah was commanded not to have children. He's a single lone prophet. But he builds a house. When the whole country is destroyed, one man's house is standing. Because these people made God their hiding place. Even when the everything destruction comes, their house lives. Shall we say amen? There is a promise for God's children who live by faith. When Israelites leave Egypt, they come to a first city which is fortified. When they come to a fortified city, which meaning which has big walls around, God says, you know, you go around it and they will fall. What is the name of the city? Well, some are awake at least. Jericho, correct. But we read about a story of a lady whose, her name is? Rahab. Can anybody tell me where her house is? Rahab's house is on the wall. Now think about God tells these people, say, go around the city, you know, one, six days, you know all the story. And then on the seventh day, what will happen? The walls fall. But Rahab, when the two spies were sent, you know, she tells them, we know, I know that, you know, Joshua chapter 2, I know that God, your God is a God in heaven on earth. I know God has given you already this city and your fear of you have fallen all the city. But when you come, remember me and my family, the favor that I have done. They say, give us a sign. She will tie a scarlet thread, a red thread to her window. Whole wall of Jericho will fall, but her house does not fall. Shall we say amen? Whole city is gone. Her family is saved. A thousand may fall at your side, a ten thousand at your right hand. If you make God your hiding place, a dwelling place, you will remain forever. Amen? That is the situation of Habakkuk. God speaks now. Second chapter, Habakkuk chapter 2. God speaks now and he says, you know, chapter 2 verse 1, he is still complaining and he's saying, I will take my stand as a watchman. I will wait for God to speak. I am waiting for God to speak, he says. I station myself on the tower. Look out to see what he will say to me. What I will answer regarding me. God is saying, I will wait, 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 wait until God speaks. My question to all of us is this, including myself. When was the last time you said to yourself, saying, I will wait till God speaks? I want God to speak to me in a clear way. When was the last time you took that? You know, Friday evenings, we are discussing about knowing God's will, how to know God's will. 
we have heard, you know, we've, we've read the book of Acts and it says the Spirit of God spoke. We've, we've seen Philip, we have seen to Peter, we have seen a, in a fasting prayer meeting how God spoke. How God speaks, God, our God is a God who speaks. Shall we say amen? We should believe that our God who speaks, then Lord, why don't you speak to me? We have read through the book of Revelation, some parts of the book of Revelation, last Friday specifically, where the Spirit of God carried me. What? Spirit of God, and the, 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 the word is, in Telugu is really good in 1 Corinthians 2. Atma anubhavamu cheta manu grahinchalata. Atma sangatulu atma anubhavamu cheta. Meaning, you have to discern spiritual things through spiritual experience. Atma anubhavamu. Ye atma anubhavamu into what is really a spiritual experience? Where his spirit was carried up to see things in heaven. His spirit was carried up to wilderness to see the great mystery of Babylon. His spirit was carried up to see the heavens and earth. You know, there are so many things that God wants to really reveal. But the thing is, people do not have faith and they do not believe that God can really do that in spirit. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, says, you know, John. Then he heard a voice behind speaking. You see, if you are in spirit, you, a natural man can never understand the things of heaven. With all your intellectual analytical skills, if you read the Bible, it doesn't make sense. Nor you may come up with analytic analysis of the entire Bible, but your experience will be completely opposite to what the Bible says. Because you have never experienced what it, what is, what it is telling you. Because you only did it through analysis and with an intellectual mind but never with the help of the Holy Spirit. When can you say, I was in spirit, so and so day God spoke to me. I was in spirit. What do you mean, I was in spirit? I want you to read that one verse, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. You know, a whole book of Revelation came because this man was spirit-filled. And this was a spirit-filled experience, entire book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I was in spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice. He was filled with the spirit. He was in spirit. That he could hear the voice of God. He saw the son of man walk among the seven golden lampstands. And he tells about this church, this church, this church. You know, Ephesus, Pergamum, Smyrna, Thyatira, you know, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. All the seven churches, God, the Lord is speaking to each one of them. Chapter 17. Verse 3, Revelation chapter 17. Here I want to sh see the verse he, word of God. He says, he carried me away in spirit into a wilderness. What an experience. You know, because the spirit of God carried him to show him things. That he saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names. And there were seven heads and ten horns. We are not going to the beast thing. But because he was in spirit, he could see the things. You know... Most of the time, Christians don't hear God's voice because they are not really serious of listening to God's voice. When was the last time you took a day off or two days off or three days off? Said, I will sit in the presence of God. Bible sp speaks about praying in spirit. Bible speaks as worshiping in spirit. Bible speaks about listening to the voice of God in spirit. Bible speaks about being carried away in spirit to see the things of things. Lord, I don't have that kind of experience. I don't know. What's your will? I don't know what's happening. Habakkuk stayed stationed. The Lord answered him. The Lord, come back to Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2 and then verse 3. Um, the Lord says this. Write the vision on a tablet and then so that those who run, read it will run. And the still the vision awaits for the appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. Verse 4. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the just shall live by faith. And God is speaking about um, how God is going to punish the Chaldeans after that. How, how he's going to punish Babylonians after they have done his work. After Israel is destroyed, God is going to punish Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, you know the story. Um, Nebuchadnezzar comes Belshazzar. After that comes Darius. The whole nation of Babylon is gone. The whole nation of Babylon is gone from the history. A beautiful nation, golden nation. God punishes them. But the Lord says, Mr. Habakkuk, you should learn to live by faith. This statement is not only for the Old Testament. You know, the New Testament writers, Apostle Paul specifically, borrowed this statement. 
Um, let me ask a question. October 31st. Today is October 30th, right? Oh, all of you are, know the date well. 31st. What is 31st? Halloween. Okay. Um, this country calls it Halloween. Europe calls it, or Asia calls it, you know what? Some other look away, some other look away. A lot of people go to, you know, graves, graveyards. And then they even do a lot of, this is all tradition that the world has invented. Usually, actually, October 31st, but India probably celebrates in uh, November 2nd. But it's called as All Saints Day. All Souls Day. All Saints Day to All Souls Day, it was made. If you read the history and the tradition, so that you'll understand. Um, it was from October 31st, they, they moved it. But still, most of the Europe, October 31st, was uh, considered as All Saints Day, um, this All Souls Day. But whatever the tradition, the, let's not uh, uh, go up at the date itself. But more important than all that is on October 31st, it is Martin Luther who went to the Wittenberg Castle and he nailed his 95 thesis. Roman Catholic Church was um, preaching or saying somehow you, you, can, you can be justified before God by works. Roman Catholic, um, a Roman Catholic monk, Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic monk. He wrote 95 points on a paper, piece of paper, went in, and then somehow the, the news got up to Pope. Pope gave um, what is called a papal bull. You know what a papal bull means? It's an it's a edict so that you should show up, and then if you, um, it's a law. He, he wrote a law saying you have to appear in court before me. So Martin Luther appears before court, and then he says, you wrote so many things, I want you to recant, meaning take it back. You know, Martin Luther said, all the practices of your church, I object, unless I am convinced by scripture, plain scripture and reason, I cannot accept it, he said. And he said, you know, it is by sola scriptura, meaning by scripture alone. Remember this word, sola scriptura means the scripture alone. Let not anybody teach you anything apart from the scripture. Shall we say amen? The whole church, Roman Catholic church, from about 480 till um, 1530s, first time people at least rebelled to start another church. There was no church other than Roman Catholic church. Roman Catholic Church was ruling the world. The whole, um, the whole world, think about following all the Roman Catholicism. There was 100 years before, there was a man called Tyndale. Tyndale attempted to translate the Bible. Um, he did not translate the, actually he did mostly translate the Bible than Wycliffe. Tyndale was burnt, was burnt for uh, translating the Bible. You know, when Tyndale was being burnt, he said one statement. William Tyndale said like this, God is going to raise one man. In 100 years, God is going to raise one man whose reforms nobody can stop. Not even Pope, he said. And God raised up Martin Luther. That he rebelled against the, um, the, the Roman Catholic Church saying not only sola scriptura, but he said, by, we are justified by faith alone. Shall we say amen? We are made right with God by faith alone. That was his main statement. There he wrote after that the Reformation five statements. There are five solas. Meaning by scripture alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, then in Christ alone, for glory of God alone. Remember these five things. Sola scriptura means by, by scripture alone. Sola fide means by faith alone. Sola gratia means by grace alone. Then he says solo Christos means in Christ alone. And only for the glory of sola dio gloria means only for God's glory alone. Meaning a man is saved only as it is mentioned in the scriptures through Christ Jesus by faith and by grace. Only for the glory of God, he says. The just shall live by faith. I want to show you a few things. Um, they're probably the next 10 minutes. I want you to uh, open scripture. Um, three, three times this is just shall live by faith is mentioned. Romans chapter 1, quickly please. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Verse 16 and 17, he says like this. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17. Paul is writing to a church. He's writing to the church at Rome. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. 
for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel saves people. That's why preaching the clear gospel is very important. We need to know what really gospel is. And then declare, and I've said that many times, you know what clear gospel is. Um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's a clear gospel that can save people. In the gospel, verse 17, for in the gospel, for in it is revealed the righteousness of God, or some translations will say righteousness from God, which is revealed from faith by faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For a person to live right before God, to be made right with God, you don't need works. It is by faith. It is your faith first in Christ, and then you work not, not to add to the faith, but your works are only uh, a proof of your faith. You are of an active faith. So this is, a, the, he's saying, that just shall live by faith. We are saved by faith. We live by faith. You know, by faith, you know, we understand the things of God. Shall we say amen? For the church, it is very clear. He says to a Roman church, for a beginning of a Christian life is by faith. If a person needs to become a Christian, he doesn't need to understand the whole Bible. Not to have, understand the whole theology. You know, this is a huge misconception people will have. Only thing what they need to understand is about God the Father and what he has done through his son Christ Jesus. It's the spirit of God who will convict that person. He need to put his faith in Jesus Christ, in the full finished work of Christ Jesus. So my dear brothers and sisters, be clear when you present the gospel. Only by faith a person, when he sees the finished work of Christ, will be saved. Christ alone is sufficient for your salvation. Shall we say amen? Quickly, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, here is the context of the church. Here is a church, um, Paul wrote very harshly to this church. Galatians, you know, somebody, the Judaizers came to the church and then they started saying, hey, unless you are circumcised, you are not, uh, you're not a Christian. He says, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, oh, foolish Galatians, he says. He's calling church foolish. Hey, Galatian church, you're foolish, he's saying. Who has deceived you? Who has bewitched you? He says. And then he says, verse 10 and verse 11. For all who rely on the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all that is written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by law. For the righteous shall live by faith. The law is not of faith. Rather, the one that does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. You know, what he's saying is not only for your salvation, you receive your, no, every curse is taken away in Christ Jesus. Shall we say amen? Oh, a lot of generational curses people will have. If you come to Christ, if you are in Christ, every curse is taken away. Amen? Because your curse is put on him. Don't let anybody tell you there is some curse on you even though you come to Christ. If you are in Christ, the blood of Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ took away every curse of yours. Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. And Jesus was the one who, was, who died on the cross signifying that. He was cursed for your sake and my sake. And he says, for the curse taken away, then he says, you have received the Holy Spirit because you had faith, he says. To live a Christian life, you need faith. It says, the just shall live by faith. You have received the Holy Spirit because you put the faith. Shall we say amen? You have received the Holy Spirit not because you've done some ritual. You received the Holy Spirit because you believed, you had faith. And that faith, through that faith, you're, you, know, you continue all along. Lastly, Hebrews chapter 10. The third time, same statement is mentioned in the New Testament, and I want to show you this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Here is a dangerous statement. Let me read the context so that you don't, uh, you don't, understand, you don't misunderstand. The entire letter of Hebrews 
um, he's saying, hey, there is a danger of falling away. Be careful of danger of falling away. Make sure your faith is not only when you begin, not only when you have it in the middle, but you, you continue in faith till the end. That is the message of Hebrews. You have seen Jesus, 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 right? Look at Jesus, look at Jesus. But make sure your faith, you stay in the faith till the end. There are a lot of people who leave faith. Actually, on Tuesday Bible study, Wednesday Bible studies, we are learning about faith. There are people who leave faith, and what will happen to their faith, we will understand. We'll let's open the scripture later on the Tuesday Bible study, Wednesday Bible studies. What happens to people who leave faith? What is their destiny? We will learn um, from the scripture later. But here, Hebrews, why, why he says holding on to that faith till the end is important. Um, Hebrews 10, let me read from verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Do not throw away your faith. For you have a need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. Verse 38, importantly. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. If a person shrinks back from faith, God says, I don't have pleasure in him. Verse 39. If, if, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. If somebody shrinks back, they are, not des they are destroyed. But those, those who have faith and will persevere, if you truly, genuinely know the Lord, you'll have the faith till the end. If you're gone in the middle, you're, you're never, um, never there till the end. Why? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, please. Hebrews chapter 3. Even the entire Calvinism teaches that, what is called perseverance of the souls, that ju they just took perseverance from this word. That if you're genuinely born again, you'll stay till the end. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. Importantly, I want to see if what will happen to a person if he, um, if he doesn't hold faith until the end. We have come to share in Christ if we indeed hold our original faith firm till the end. You know, firm till the end. If somebody does not stay till the end, that means um, they will never enter. They were never saved. Um, Verse 12, chapter 3, verse 12. Take care, brothers, let there be any of you an evil and unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Therefore, exhort one another every day as long as it is today so that none of you may be hardened by deceitfulness of sin. Why do we need preaching? Why do we need continued preaching? Why do we need Bible studies? Why do we need encouragement of God's word? Because as long as it is called today, we just need to encourage Hey, in the midst of a struggle, keep on running. We need people who will just sit on the stands. You know, when somebody's running the race, you know, there are people who will cheer them up. Come on, run. Come on, come on, come on. Everybody will cheer up sitting in the stands. And the one who's running will not stop. He will finish the finish line. We need the church. We need the fellowship. We need a prayer fellowship. We need continuously the church as an assembly. You know why? We need cheer up. We need somebody who should cheer us up. That our faith will not stop in the middle. In the race, half in the race will say, I'm done with the race. I need you, you need me, so that we can pray and encourage one another. And says, now stay in your faith till the end. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't let, you know, shrink back. That's why that word, the just shall live by faith, quoted three times in the New Testament. Romans 1.17 Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38. He wrote, I, last Sunday I said, there is a letter specifically wrote to a suffering people. What is that letter? First Peter, last week we have done. Even Hebrews is written for people who are being tortured. You know, Roman uh, emperors, there were four terrible emperors. One after Nero was um, the, uh, Claudia, you know, Caligula and then Domitian and then um, one more. These four guys were terrible emperors who killed Christians for fun. Who took Christians and then who made them burn incense for idols. You know, to, they could not bear hardships. They said, it is, we will live on this earth if we just, you know, somehow go burn an incense to an idol. A lot of people, because of hardness of their, you know, of their problems, they left Christianity. They left Christ. And then the, the writer of Hebrews is writing to them and saying, hey, don't shrink back. A lot of people took your property, so be it, don't be worried. You have a greater property, he's saying. 
You know, Hebrews chapter 10 talks about it. People took your properties. People killed your relatives. People took all your money. The emperor took your money. But do not be discouraged. You have a greater wealth in heaven. So don't throw away confidence, my dear brothers and sisters. Even when you see everything going against. Oh, Lord, we don't know what's happening. We hear about news of lay layoffs everywhere, you know, depression everywhere, you know, death everywhere, problems everywhere. We don't know what's going to happen to my family. But if, I'll tell you this. The just shall live by faith. Shall we say amen? You heard the story of Rahab. You heard the story of Jeremiah. You heard Habakkuk. They lived even when everybody were dying around. A thousand may fall at your side, a ten thousand at your right hand. It will not come near your dwelling. Shall we say amen? The whole world will perish. But those who wait on the Lord, they will wait on the Lord. Their lives will be preserved. I will close with this. He, Habakkuk chapter 3, please. Habakkuk chapter 3. After he waited on the Lord. Why waiting on God is so important in our lives? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, says the word of God. They will renew their strength and they will fly like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint, says Isaiah 40, 31. If you wait on God, he will take care of you. Lastly, I will, I will close with this. He, Habakkuk chapter 3, he starts complaining. He starts praying and saying, Lord, he talks, he talks about all the uh, struggles that he, he's seen. And then at the end, now when God's word has finalized, it says Babylon is coming to destroy everyone. He says, Lord, verse 17, though the fig tree does not blossom, nor fruit be in the vines, the produce of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, but the flocks be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Oh, even if I don't have my health, even if I don't have my wealth, even if I don't have a perfect, you know, um, job opportunity, or perfectly, you know, everything is not going on, still I will rejoice in God. You know, when we, we will only, when we wait in the presence of God, we'll understand that our life is made for God and not for things around. Shall we say amen? amen? You know, our perspective thing that, you know, everything should be, I should have a comfortable, pleasurable life, or nothing should go left or to the right, will be our perspective until we stay in the presence of God. If you stand in the presence of God, you'll understand. Everything in this world is temporal. Only God is eternal. Shall we say amen? amen. We'll understand that God is eternal and everything that we have. Your health, your job, your wealth, and everything, the situations, you know, the country um, deteriorating. These things are, are temporal, and only God is eternal. And you will never rejoice in them. What needs to happen for a Christian is this. What you take joy in has to be changed. If you take joy watching a movie, God will change us. If you take joy listening to worldly music, God will change you. If you're a Christian, if you're a true believer, and if you somehow are enjoying all this, he will show you that there is no joy in all of that. Even the temporary pleasures, he will take away the temporary pleasures so that we may know that God alone is our joy. He say, there he says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deers. He makes me tread on high places. He's saying, I rejoice in the God of my salvation. He makes me go up onto the mountains. You know, he says, Lord is my strength. When God said, you know, whole nation will be destroyed. Now prophet is saying, Lord, you are there for me. That's enough for me. The whole nation may be destroyed. But if you live by faith, you will remain. Because, you know, who will remain? Not if you do what you want. You know, I want you to um, read this one last verse. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. This is an important verse and that this has um, really bothered me for a while. And I ask God and so many times in prayer. You know, I, I discuss scripture with my Lord most of the times. You know, rather than reading books or commentaries, I discuss scripture with the Lord. So we say we should all come to that habit. Discuss scripture with the Lord. Amen. You know why? If God explains you, it will be more than all the worldly explanations. If God tells you the meaning of something, 
that is beyond what a man can share. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17 says like this. The world is passing away with its desires. He says, what is in the world? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that's in the world is the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, and the pride of possession. And they are not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world is passing away with its desire. But he that does the will of the Father, the will of God, abides forever. If you do the will of God, you'll remain forever. Yesterday we had a wonderful time with these children recounting missionary lives. I'm so glad I said, Lord willing, you know, these kids may be future preachers, evangelists, and uh, pastors and missionaries. Shall we say amen? All these kids did an excellent job. When they were reading these things, you know, somebody did Judson, somebody did William Carey, somebody did C.D. Studd, somebody did Eric Little, um, somebody did David Livingston, you know, all these testimonies, their missionary lives, they are, they, are, they are talking about these little, our children talking about it. That, that made me excited like anything. We are talking about them centuries later. Centuries later. For not their education, for not their academic accomplishments, not their wealth they weren't, not their houses they lived in, not the cars that they drove. We are thinking about them. The, st the statement that C.T. Studd, the poem that C.T. Studd um, wrote. You, do you know who was C.T. Studd? C.T. Studd was a great cricketer for England. He left his career in cricket to go as a missionary. Eric Little was an athlete. He left everything to go um, to China. These are athletes who are successful, but he, Eric Little is not known for his... Um, Athletics or the medals that he won. He was known for how he lived. And that last poem of C.D. Studd was this. Only one life. Very short. Soon to be passed. What you do for the Lord will remain. What you do for the Lord only will remain. Everything else that you do in this world will perish. Meaning if you live a life that is self-centered, in the midst of all the problems and all the worries, learn to wait on the Lord. And when you wait on the Lord, you'll turn it into complete worship. Where Habakkuk said, you know, even though I, my olive trees are not blooming, neither I have, you know, wine, meaning grapes, neither are there cattle in my shed, yet... I learn to rejoice in my God. You know, if you're looking all around the world, there will be worry setting in. But if you wait on God, you will know that He, you only need him and him and him alone. That we should rejoice in the God of our salvation. He should become our strength. He should make our feet like the deer so that I can, we can go up. And then after the Habakkuk, you know, a lot of time men of God wrote, wrote songs. You know, Habakkuk chapter 3 from verse 17 to the end is a song. And at the end, you might see in your Bible, it says, he gave this to the, the choir leader on a stringed instrument. So the choir leader can make this as a song. Chicago Bible Fellowship, the, the pastor who founded this, uh, wrote a song on this, on Habakkuk 3.17. Harshintanu, Harshintanu, na rakshana karta na devuni andu. Um, he, he wrote a song when he did not have a job. He was well educated, he had a master's degree, um, but he didn't have a job in Delhi. He was going to his church and God was reminding him of the scripture and he wrote a song. He wrote a song on it. You know, when God speaks, you learn to rejoice and worship him and that will become a song in your own heart. A song which will of rejoicing. I won't rejoice in everything else. I rejoice in my God. Shall we bow our heads? If you are worrying today, if you are worrying about all the things that are happening around you, political situation.